Watch this. It's Friday on the 208. Thank you so much for your company. Ahead, we're going to dive into international notes all the way down to molecules of water here in Idaho. And in Idaho, a new law concerning who can use what bathroom can now go into effect, says a judge. We'll have details on the transgender bathroom ruling. Around the world, security in Jewish communities is heightened tonight. A warning from the former leader of Hamas as communities keeping a close eye out. That includes here in Boise. We'll hear from the executive director of Ahavath Beth Israel. Have you looked at the calendar today? Well, update for you. It's Friday the 13th in October. Very nice, very spooky. We're taking a trip down a scary memory lane in a haunted Idaho campus. A federal judge has denied a request to block Idaho's new law regulating access to school bathrooms and facilities based on biological sex from taking effect. Welcome to the 208, I'm Joe Paris. The law will start being implemented in 21 days and we have followed this on the 208 for really the better part of a year. The transgender bathroom bill and in a lawsuit that was brought by a transgender student and an LGBTQ advocacy group, U.S. District Judge David Nye ruled that the plaintiffs failed to establish the law was likely unconstitutional. So the plaintiffs argued that the law violates equal protection, Title IX, and privacy rights. Here's the end result, though, from court. Quote, ultimately, the court is not convinced that plaintiffs can prevail on their equal protection claims because the law is based upon sex, not gender identity. And two, privacy and safety are important government interests, and separating these types of facilities on the basis of sex is substantially related to the achievement of those objectives. That's what Judge Nye wrote in his decision. So the court held that the law does not classify based on transgender status, but rather on biological sex, saying, quote, Senate Bill 1100, the bathroom bill, was enacted to protect the privacy of the sexes. He added the judge that reasonable people can support one position and not have any animus or ill intent for the other possession. So on the Title IX claim, Judge Nye found that the federal law, quote, specifically allows for separate uh, sex separate facilities and therefore Senate Bill 1100 does not violate Title IX. It adheres to it. So while allowing the law to take effect, the judge did not dismiss the lawsuit entirely, noting that other courts have found merit in similar challenges. So the case will continue, but without an injunction halting enforcement. The law requires that public schools here in Idaho designate bathrooms and facilities for use by males or females only, and they have to restrict access based on biological sex. A provision also mandates that separate sleeping quarters on school trips. Again, though, this will go into effect in November, so Idaho schools will have to work to make sure they have the appropriate policies in place. News for you on a challenge to Idaho's voter ID laws. Idaho has a new law that we told you about. It removes student IDs as a valid form of voter identification. The remedy for the new law, the creation of a free student ID for, or excuse me, a free state ID for students or really any person that needs one and qualifies. The group's Babe Vote and the League of Women Voters here in Idaho, they filed a lawsuit over this whole situation. And last week we learned that a district court judge had dismissed that lawsuit. That case will be appealed to the Idaho Supreme Court. However, it's not the only case in play here. Our partners over at the Idaho Press, Laura Guido, she reported that a federal judge is allowing a different case to move forward. And this is a case from March for Our Lives Idaho and the Idaho Alliance for Retired Americans. And the case is filed against Secretary of State Phil McGrain. This, too, is about how the law removes student IDs as accepted voter identification in Idaho elections. The judge in the case ruled that the plaintiffs sufficiently demonstrated that they, they may be harmed by the laws and they are, quote, ripe for review. The complaint also argues that the legislation violates the 26th Amendment, which states that the right to vote for citizens who are 18 and older shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of age. They argue that the laws were motivated by, quote, discriminatory purpose and were adopted in response to an unprecedented wave of political activism by young Idahoans and represent a clear backlash to that activism, according to the lawsuit. Eyes of the world remain on the war between Israel and the terrorist group Hamas. An updated number for you here on Friday evening. At least 1,300 people, including 258 soldiers, have been killed in Israel, and more than 3,300 have been injured. In Gaza, almost 
2,000 people have been killed and more than 7,300 have been injured. And the numbers are likely below what is in reality. These numbers seem to catch up as the work goes on. But today, Friday, Friday night, it's a complicated time for Jewish communities around the world. The former leader of Hamas called for protests in support of Palestinians. Some read into that thinking he was calling for much more. Now, this caused a security alert through Jewish communities around the world. And there is something that I heard this week that really makes me sit back in silence. Just listen to this fact. Hamas has a goal to end Israel and to kill Jews. And they launched an attack six days ago, killing more Jewish people in a single day since the Holocaust. The Holocaust, of course, was the effort to exterminate the Jewish people. And on the backdrop of all of that, it is a very troubling time for Jews, and it really should be for everyone. Here in Boise, at the Havaf Beth Israel, they too are monitoring what is happening. And on the eve of the Sabbath, we visited with Executive Director Loy Roy Ledesma about being safe while not compromising beliefs. He says great partnerships with law enforcement make a difference. The, the Boise Police Department, Chief Weininger, Captain Ruffalo, and all of these officers um, they've been awesome. Uh, they have been very responsive, um, the professional, uh, you know, uh, we have that partnership. Uh, we have, I have a partnership with the FBI. Uh, I have friends there. I have friends within the ATF, uh, Department of Homeland Security. I mean, I've got all of these partnerships uh, with all of these agencies, uh, and we're in constant contact. And um, anytime anything happens, um, whether here in the state or nationally or internationally, uh, my first, um, you know, uh, correspondence is to those individuals and, and, and those partners. To be very clear, there are no credible threats to Jewish communities and events in our area, but as you can imagine, this is scary to think about and these communities need to prepare. I also want to be very crystal clear here on the 208. And I read all your emails and texts and I see what's going on on social media. To be crystal clear, we know that people in Gaza are being killed. We are not ignoring that. And there is no way around the humanitarian crisis going on in and around Gaza, no matter who you want to give blame to. The fact of the matter is there are people suffering on both sides of the border. It is very ugly inside Gaza. War is ugly and so is the conflict. And we are working to get a perspective from someone who knows Gaza from the ground. We want to hear a perspective from someone on the inside part of Gaza. We heard from someone who lived in Israel this past week and we've heard from some of you asking for another perspective. We are working to get that. But if you do know someone that would be interested in talking with us, please feel free to reach out. Okay, on this Friday, we got a quagga update for you. Remember these critters? Well, today marks the end of the 10-day treatment in the water to take out the invasive species. Idaho State Department of Agriculture has some insights for us on Friday evening. And, of course, as you remember, they were using a copper-based formulation called Natrix in the water. That was to kind of knock out the quagga. So, ISDA tells me today that the copper levels are dissipating according to the anticipated levels in their treatment plan. And they say that copper levels already are significantly decreasing in the river and that this is a very dynamic process, so they're going to continue to monitor the copper levels in the water. But in terms of determining the success of the program, ISDA says that the staff, they're actively collecting the quagga mussel larvae samples from the impacted area. Interesting to note that the quagga, they stop reproducing once the water gets below 14 degrees Celsius. Once the water gets down to that temperature, ISDA staff will pause on sampling until the springtime. The larvae monitor in the impacted area will be an ongoing effort to determine if this was a successful treatment or how significant it might be. But some in the area, you may notice a change in the water in the treated area. So I want to talk to you about this. The product Natrix has caused algae and other aquatic plant mortality as expected. And the color of the river, as you're looking at here, this was shot just this week, it's a result of the algae being removed from the impacted area by treatment. So the color of the river is temporary. It may look very different than when you and your family have been on it, but as the river is expected to recover once the copper treatment goes away, the copper levels are dissipating, and of course, the water is expected to return to normal. So, closures, we should tell you this, they are still in effect. Access to the Mid Snake River from Twin Falls Dam to Niagara Springs is still closed to public access. Next week, the public can expect an update from ISDA on the closure of the Snake River and potentially other developments on water closures in the area, but we will keep you posted on that.
Well, happy Friday. There's a lot going around uh, the state of Idaho. So to catch us up on what's going on around the 208, Hector Mendoza has the 411. Looking for a cool winter job? Well, tomorrow, Bogus Basin is hosting a job fair. The mountain, which saw its first snowfall of the season earlier this week, is looking to hire about 500 employees for the upcoming season. And if you're interested, head to their downtown Boise sales office tomorrow from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Prospective employees will have the chance to learn about available positions, meet the hiring managers, and learn about the benefits of working at Bogus. Also happening tomorrow, the Harvest Festival in Eagle. That's happening from 10 until 4 at Heritage Park in downtown Eagle. There will be a fall market, live music, crafts, food trucks, and free pumpkin decorating. The Eagle Trolley will be providing free carpooling from Eagle Elementary to downtown Eagle. Well, we know it's a little early to start thinking about the holiday season, but the Idaho State Department of Education wants students help now creating their holiday card. Yep, the Idaho Holiday Card Contest is back. You can see last year's winner on your screen now, and the contest is open to all Idaho public and charter school students in kindergarten through 12th grade. Kids should draw a holiday or winter picture, then scan and submit it as a PDF on the Idaho State Department of Education's website, or you can mail it to their office. The last day to submit drawings is on Friday, November 17th, and make sure to check out all the guidelines on their website. There will be an overall winner chosen from K through 6th grade and 7th through 12th grade. The winner's artwork will be on the department's official holiday cards, plus winners will get their own set of cards. And that's the 411. I'm Hector Mendoza. We're transitioning the show into a more spooky feel after the break. We brought you an Idaho man with the face of horror this week, and he's in a contest to be the scariest. We have an update on his effort. Before it gets too scary, though, we want to hear from you. Specifically, what questions do you have for the candidates to be Boise mayor? We want your specific questions. Send them now, or at least think them over until I ask again. Also, taking your comments, questions, all kinds of things, you know the number, 208 321-5614. If you send us a message, please use hashtag the 208 and sign your message so we know who it's from. All right, it's October and today, it's Friday the 13th. Plus there's an eclipse happening tomorrow. Something weird's going on, right? But that's nothing new for Idaho. We have all the strange stuff. Did you know we have a lot of ghost stories and haunted places? If you know one, send us some info about it. But did you know there's a haunted old school? Yeah, we're gonna tell you the story about the Albion School that closed decades ago, but still has plenty of activity on campus. It's today's 208 redial. <laughs> Just three years after Idaho gained statehood, the town of Albion was more than just a stop between Boise and Salt Lake City. Oh, yeah, there were 4,000 people lived here. 
George Kelly's family goes back two generations in Albion before he was born here 82 years ago. Oh, it was wonderful. Growing up, George went to grade school like almost everyone else in Casha County. Right here, Albion Normal. Albion State Normal School was a two-year college built in 1893 to teach Idaho's future teachers. Yeah, 1950 was, I think, the last day, the last time they run. It closed in 1951, to be exact, and by that time, some 6,000 student teachers had passed through this campus. But some would say some of them and some of those who served them didn't fully depart. Oh, yeah, I've heard that. Uh huh. There was a lady that would walk across the grounds at two in the morning with a backpack on that was trying to go to school. I mean, I heard all kinds of stories. Heather Mortensen and her husband bought the 35-acre property at auction 10 years ago with the intent to turn it into a retreat and event center. But every October, with the help of those stories, they turn the old school into a haunted house tour. And so this is Comish Hall. And this is, I think it's around 50,000 square feet, and it's the women's dormitory. Because of this building, Heather says, she became convinced haunted wasn't just a holiday gimmick. One year, on Halloween night, she and some staff were standing in the courtyard at the close of another season when they saw a light in an upstairs window. It looked like a flashlight, but not bright. No, it looked like kind of a dim flashlight kind of moving around in there. But nobody mm -mm. was inside, something they discovered soon after. Nobody in the, in the whole building. So I don't know what that was. <laughs> Kay Powell worked as a night watchman here for 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> and he's heard of several sightings of a dark-haired woman around the women's dorm. She would be at the one end of the hall or something and, and just kind of disappear. The same woman supposedly seen by a paranormal investigation team while they were setting up their equipment. And they came running outside and said, oh, we just saw this lady standing in the hallway in a white dress. And it was another Halloween night when Heather says she was clearing Comish at closing time when she passed a scared couple coming down these steps. And they were looking up and they were listening as I heard as well, a voice that said, Please don't leave, wait, come back. And it sounded like a young woman or a young boy, I couldn't tell which. Heather continued upstairs. And I took my flashlight and scanned the whole second floor and looked everywhere and could not find anybody. Heather says she's still kind of a skeptic, even after all these years. But having met so many that went to school here more than a half a century ago, she understands why they wouldn't want to leave. They met their spouses here. They just have such good memories going to school here that if they have passed on, I feel like maybe they're traveling through and wanting to revisit those memories that were so important in their life. Memories that may linger longer than the broken down buildings they inhabit. There have been too many things happen to Brian Holmes. deny it, I guess. Idaho's News Channel 7. Well, if you like this part of Idaho history, you are in luck because we're going to have some more haunted stories for you coming up later this month on the 208. My um, name is Chris Hasnerl, and I'm a contestant um, running to win the prize of the next face of horror. That is uh, pretty scary, and that contest, by the way, it comes with a $13,000 prize, and of course, you get to try to meet one of the horror heroes, the actor who plays Jason in the Friday the 13th movies. Fitting for today. Anyways, good news, everyone. You helped him get to the quarterfinals. He posted this on Facebook saying that he's moving on to the next challenge called the Living Dead Round. Very scary. Well, you can help get Chris uh, one step closer again to the next round by voting. Voting for this round starts on Monday at 11. You can only vote once for free a day and on the Faces of Horror website until each round closes. Make sure to check back in every week until November to see if Chris has moved on. Also earlier this week, we asked you what Chris's zombie name should be. So here are your answers. Mike in Caldwell said, Chris Zombie. Someone else said fester and rot. 
It's a good one. And then Lance in Nampa sent his own zombie take, which is also very impressive. Also a scary building he's in front of. He said that was from the zombie walk in 2016. We might need to work on some of those names, but if you have any other ideas or any thoughts, we'll get to them at the end of the show. Send us a message. All right, we'll be back. We want to hear from you on this Friday, specifically from our Boise viewers. Soon KTVB will be hosting some Boise mayoral contenders for a debate, and we want to know what questions you have, so send them our way. And really send anything our way. Questions, comments, photos, really anything. Send it to our number at 208-321-5614. Please be sure to use your name and hashtag the 208. We're going to get to these live at the end of the show. Agriculture is Idaho's number one industry. No surprise there. We have miles of beautiful farmland across our state, but the work is not easy. Harsh conditions paired with very long days makes it hard to attract farm workers, which is why farmers and dairymen in Idaho rely on foreign born workers. In the 20 plus years that we have used the H2A program, I have had one American applicant that has come to me for a job. And once they got on farm, they worked one day and never showed up again. Currently, there is only a seasonal work visa program for unfilled agriculture jobs called the H-2A program. But year-round operations like dairies, they need year-round workforces. And that workforce is 90% foreign-born and no year-round visa program. Idaho's number one agricultural industry is very fragile something that Congressman Mike Simpson is trying to change with his legislation called the Farm Workforce Modernization Act. The bipartisan bill aims to provide documentation for the undocumented agriculture workers already in the state by providing year-round visas for future H-2A agriculture workers and for those who choose to provide a pathway to citizenship. 90% of those people that I talk to, citizenship is not the big thing, they just want to work. And they're working in jobs that Americans won't fill. 
This Monday on the 208, we are diving into farm worker immigration reform and the future of farming in Idaho in a half hour special right here on News Channel 7, right o'clock, right of course at 5 o'clock. We're going to hear directly from undocumented farm workers who are asking for protection and more from Congressman Mike Simpson. We're going to hear from him on his plan to keep Idaho's dairies afloat. All right, we got your questions and comments ahead. All right, let's get to some of your comments, questions, thoughts at the end of the week here. This person says, I am pleased to see what you're looking to find someone with the connection to Gaza to speak on the present situation there. Both Israelis and Palestinians are suffering at the hands of Hamas, a terrorist organization which doesn't value human life. Their story does need to be told. Yes, we agree. All righty, next comment coming in. This person says, how does this apply in terms of the transgender bathroom bill? How does this apply to transgender individuals that have gender confirmation surgery to align with their gender identity? So this is based on biological sex. So that is kind of the mark here that they're looking at. So um, as far as I understand, just if you had gender uh, confirmation surgery, that doesn't change the law. So it's based on biological sex. So that is the answer to that, but we are going to continue to follow. Uh, this person says, do we have a kill count after the treatment uh, for the quagga mussels in terms of how many fish were killed? We do not, but we will circle back with ISDA as they get those numbers for us. And then this person says that the Golden Year Senior Center used to be a bank. It is now haunted. That's Jerry from Shoshone. And then this person says that they had a great week with their new partner out there. All right. 